Christine Sierra has blazed many trails in her life. She was among the first Mexican-American women to get a doctorate in political science and helped build the field of Latino-Latina political studies. Ms. Sierra joined the University of New Mexico in 1986, and her publications have focused on activism in the Mexican-American community around immigration, Hispanic politics in New Mexico, and the politics of Latina women in the United States. Now emerita professor at UNM, Sierra sat down with correspondent Megan Kamrick to talk about her life, her scholarship, and this year's elections. Christine Sierra, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. You were one of the very first Latinas to get a PhD in political science. What drew you to that field? Well, I'd have to start with my upbringing and my parents. Um, we as a family were always discussing current events at the kitchen table. And my parents weren't really involved in civic organization or anything. They, they were habitual voters. They were you know, reliable voters and taught us a lot, I think, of how to uh, think about values and aspirations and so on. So it just happened that I grew up um, being tuned in to current events. And given the, the age I am, I saw as a young kid on TV uh, fights over civil rights and my dad um, looking at uh, the National Guard prohibiting, you know, trying to integrate the schools in the South and teaching me all this stuff. But you know, Megan, I didn't, I mean, I, and so politics were, was always kind of a, a hobby, I'd say, or an, a side interest, because actually when I went to college um, and I started at UTEP, went there a year, I was a math major and a chemistry minor. And when I transferred to the University of Texas in Austin, I maintained that. But then all these social movements were going on around me, and I wanted to study human and social and political behavior more than equations and uh, being in a chemistry lab. So um, I just switched majors, went into what UT Austin calls government, uh, which was political science. Mm -hmm. And then I just kept going. I, maybe it's because I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. Well, you got your doctorate at Stanford yes. University in 1983. You must have been one of the only women of color there. Well, in class. yeah, what I was. was. That like? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was uh, one of t nine, then eventually ten incoming students, and I assure you, I was the only. I believe, person of color in that entering class of graduate students in political science. There were a few other Mexican-Americans, just a handful, uh, but they were all guys. And so I was the first uh, Chicana or Mexican-American mm -hmm. woman. Uh, and I, I persevered. I found, you know, I could do the work. What was hard, though, was um, what I'd say institutional, in a way, both encouragement but also resistance and so there were a lot of things at that point in time not only at Stanford from, but uh, other places that didn't really understand what um, my experience was what we wanted to study in American politics uh, diverting from the old traditional conventional approaches and stuff and really studying what I want to do is write a dissertation on my own community, my own population, which I ended up doing. But to give you an example, one of the most friendly professors at Stanford at the time, I went to see him and he says, so Christine, you want to study Mexico? And I said, well, um, not really. I, I don't mind studying Mexico. And actually, that was a second field. I said, but I want to study Mexican Americans. And so that was an, I, an example of how far we had to go. And I produced mm. the first dissertation on the Mexican-American population in the United States at, at the, in that department. But ultimately, I became the third Mexican-American woman in the country to gain a PhD in political science. 
You've written extensively now about people of color in political office and leadership, and you help build the field that we now think of as Latino, Latina yes. politics. Yes. Which apparently your professor didn't know about, <laughs> and you had to help build. And you've also studied women in politics. It's far more common now to have scholarship and studies on Latinos in politics. Is yes. that a bad thing? No, I think it's great. And. Uh, personally, I get a whole lot of satisfaction and energy from seeing um, some of the things that I help to put into place to um, build uh, avenues for more representation within academia or within university classrooms or uh, re recruiting students to graduate school uh, who looked like me or maybe shared common backgrounds like me. No, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and I will say this, that one time, I remember it was election night, uh, election night 2000, and I was asked to give uh, the color commentary, if you will, for election <laughs> night and uh, on one of the other chan TV channels. And so I spoke about um, Hispanics uh, uh, gaining um, more representation. I definitely spoke about women in politics at the time and so on. And after that public appearance on television, there was some graffiti written on a building at UNM, the building that we occupied as a department, mm -hmm. denouncing me for um, actually racist comments and I thought, how was I racist? All I talked about was his, were Hispanics and women. And, and what I think after thinking about it, Megan, is that people were simply not used to hearing discussion about Hispanics and U.S. politics, maybe in New Mexico, but not U.S. politics, women and so on. And it was somehow offensive to them that I didn't talk just about American politics. Why? So this has thankfully shifted since that. Time. Yeah, and that's that's that what is shocking. It was 2000. Why yes. do you think it has shifted? Well, partially demographic change, student demands. Uh, it's a different world. Um, I think that the demographic change and the rise of the Latino population, and other populations of color, uh, has really taken hold and some of the outcomes are more elected officials getting, uh, uh, more people of color getting into elected office, more students getting into the classrooms and so on. It's still, it's still uh, important to recognize that there's underrepresentation of people of color, whether it's in academia as faculty or students or uh, in public office. But I think that the, the America is changing and that change is pressuring institutions to change along with that demographic change. So the more complex, the more diverse our population becomes, then those uh, forces will start to take shape within things like academia. And, and hence, there's such a demand now for teaching Latino politics and Latino politics or Asian Americans, uh, uh, and, and so that's really very satisfying to me that we now have more faculty and are producing more faculty who can have expertise in those areas. This here seems to be a watershed moment for women of color running for office, and some said it's a response to President Trump. Is that the whole story? No, that's not the whole story. That's a, it's a long story, a long story in the making. Certainly the response to this climate, this political climate, uh, certainly the response of many women who, and when women do get into elected office, by far they are affiliated as Democrats. They're uh, not necessarily that the Democratic Party has been a great recruiter <laughs> of women, but rather that women, once they uh, uh, seek political office, they usually run as Democrats. Uh, but we've also seen some expansion of the ranks slowly with Republican women. But no, that's not the whole story. And so. I co-authored a book um, on people of color getting into elected office. And what we found was it was a long time coming. Uh, we call our book Contested Transformation, meaning that the country is transforming 
as I mentioned, as demographic change, uh, population diversity, it has led to different people of color getting into elected office. But our profile is showing them at the local level, very much concentrated in city councils and county commissions and school boards. Then incrementally and slowly they go into state legislatures and then they may get into Congress. And then now maybe we will see some featured as potential presidential candidates. But it is a long time coming. Women of color have high rates of educational attainment. Uh, they actually have more education than men of color and than white women in general. Well, indeed, some scholars have argued there's actually a Latina advantage yes. in politics. They tend to perform better in the polls yes. than male candidates. But political parties aren't always leveraging this no. advantage. So is there sexism that still needs to be overcome? I don't really know what exactly it is, but that's absolutely right, that, that there is a Latina advantage. Uh, and I think I would put it this way, that not only Latinas, but we found that women of color can speak to different audiences simultaneously. You know, in academia, we call it intersectionality. Mm -hmm. What that means is that these women of color come to the forefront and can speak, if you will, language, the language of different constituencies, can talk to other women, can talk to minority populations, can talk to working class people middle-class people, highly educated people. And so they have a lot of ways to relate to people. In addition, they have a lot of networks because we know that women come from uh, having been involved with PTAs or, or uh, civil, civic organizations or religious organizations. So they bring a lot of resources. They have become attractive candidates. And I think also because women still are sort of novel. I mean, our, our, our ranks are still underrepresented at all levels of government. So if you're looking at American voters who are kind of sick and tired of the same old, same old, or want a real change, um, oftentimes I think that maybe gender matters. And I can't answer the party question. I, I, I know that parties will say they're trying to recruit women, but the women, candidate, the women elected officials that we talked to did not credit the parties mm. to any great extent. They credited their family members and their neighbors and their friends saying, why don't you run for office? <laughs> and of course they first said, oh, I can't do that. That's right, they <laughs> probably they said, said, oh, I don't know. And then they you said, know. all right. And then they thought, why not? <laughs> How are Latino and Latino organizations and political campaigns similar to the earlier days of Latino and Chicano activities and activism? Uh, you mean in terms of current campaigns? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I think all campaigns have become more professional mm -hmm. in that now, uh, you know, we've seen it with candidates here in, in CD1 and CD2, uh, one higher, run, especially running for Congress, you need a pollster and you need a fundraiser and you need a treasurer and you need all this expertise around you and a campaign manager. Probably in the old days, they relied on more, and I know that some of those candidates did rely more on family members and friends um, and so forth. But, uh, so it's become more of a professional thing. Uh, the other thing is the overwhelming influence of money. Mm. And so the higher level you run, but even here in New Mexico, even in state legislative office races, uh, we can see that it's starting to take money to get your name out, whether it's on a mailer or, uh, or on television. So I don't know, Megan, I think that overall campaigns and candidates have had to kind of fall in line in seeking that media attention, seeking that outreach, and simply needing more resources to do it. Are there central themes or issues galvanizing Latino candidates around immigration? Well, or, I should say, or like immigration. Like immigration, you know, yeah. I would, I would put immigration in the top, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in general, in the top three or four issues. Uh, 
I would say that because this our pre current president is making immigration the litmus test and the playbook for many a Republican candidate running in the midterm elections, and I'll, I, I want to uh, mm -hmm. elaborate on that a bit. But sure, uh, the politics of immigration are quite prominent now. Um, and, and across America, I mean, we saw what happened with the family separation policy, the current uh, uh, abeyance or, or, or not knowing what's going to happen to the DACA kids, those kids who are here but could get legal status for a temporary period of time. Um, those kinds of things are still to be decided. And sure, I, overall, Latino public opinion shows that Latinos are coalescing, fairly cohesive around protecting what they see are their rights or the larger community. And in the past, there have been decades in the past where, for example, Mexican-American organizations in, in the 40s and the 50s were showing some of them that they had anti-immigrant mm. uh, attitudes. Um, uh, but that has changed uh, pretty much since the 60s and 70s mobilizations. And now it really is a com community's feeling under siege. Do you think that's true even in New Mexico where it, immigration hasn't been as strong an issue or as sure. important? As an example, sure. And this is not, again, it's not um, a neat and tidy way of saying that there's this side and this side. But let's take Governor Martinez's uh, attempt to stop uh, giving state licenses, driving licenses to mm -hmm. undocumented immigrants. Uh, the New Mexico state legislature, i.e. the Democrats in the legislature, i.e. the Hispanic Democrats in the legislature, were front and center in that battle. And for the most part, coalesced uh, in opposition to Governor Martinez's uh, policy. In the end, they made, they made a, up a compromise, but it was with some support from immigrant rights groups. Now again, Governor Martinez herself is Hispanic, so that complicates the, um, the narrative I'm giving. But sure, even in New Mexico, we have seen um, immigrant organizations and allies come to the forefront to try to say, uh-uh, not in our state. And that's the difference, mm -hmm. that there's a different tone here as opposed to Texas and Arizona. There's a different Hispanic leadership core here, and they're very comfortable wielding the power that they can muster. Uh, they're not marginalized, have not been marginalized uh, for a long time in politics, and so that gives the edge to, I think, Hispanic solidarity on immigration in New Mexico. But yeah, you betcha, even in New Mexico, it has become an issue and is an issue and will be an issue. I'm sure in Congressional District 2, where Sochi Torres Small is running as a candidate, Democratic candidate for Steve Pierce's position, uh, she will be talking about the border, uh, border security, and immig immigrant rights. And she's running against a very strong Trump supporter. And it's because Yvette Harrell, the Republican candidate, is going to, so far what I've seen is she's following the, Republic, the National Republican playbook of making immigration an issue in the sense of us versus them, in the sense of uh, a Trump call to arms that we have to be, you know, have to have this border wall. Of course, the border towns don't want it, including my hometown of El Paso. <laughs> uh, we see much more an integrated uh, economy, integrated families, an integrated border, even environmentally integrated, that a w such a wall just doesn't make sense. But sure, uh, that will be an example. I don't know that Pierce and Michelle, Steve Pierce and Michelle Lujan Grisham will run on that. Um, but it, it, may, it may creep up. Yeah, and we saw massive marches in 2006 around immigration and the Dreamer movement was quite vocal. How are those movements affecting, or, or how are grassroots movements influence, influencing policy today? Well, I think that right now, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately, that spirit and that persistence 
is on hold or is, is really struggling against uh, an administrative state, an apparatus that is very much against them. So you've seen it pull back? Um, the dreamers, I don't know that they ever pull back. They, <laughs> they show up at rallies and they're just, uh, their energy and their undocumented and unafraid status is, to me, an inspiration of young people who have really learned American politics, who have really learned American values of participation. I mean, that's the irony, Art, that, that the irony is that they really are Americans in action. But I would say this, that over the course of my research career, when I first started studying Latinos and immigration politics, I was in DC at the Brookings Institution. I could observe Congress and, uh, and the interactions between Congress and the Reagan White House and so on. At that point in time, there were major national Latino organizations that demanded a seat at the table. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus was quite influential. Uh, and they weighed in to what eventually became the Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, of 1986, mm -hmm. famously offering uh, uh, legal status to a whole lot of people. Uh, since that time, it's kind of ebbed and flowed, uh, but the resurgence that we spoke about, about the immigrant rights uh, marches, the immigrants themselves undocumented themselves, revitalized those claims for inclusion. The, the indication that they wanted a path to legal entry. And the thing that keeps you illegal is the lack of opportunity to enter legally with a 20 to 20, 30 year wait uh, in line for getting legal entry. What impact could demographics have on these issues over the next few decades as the percentage of the electorate who are people of color increases? Yes. Well, we're going to see what we've seen, we're gonna see what we see now continuing. And that is that we're going to see uh, elected officials produced from populations that have never produced an elected official. Uh, and that includes, you know, um, uh, uh, South Asians, people from India, uh, or of mixed race. Um, Kamala Harris is the new U.S. Senator in California who comes from black and South Asian heritage. We have our first Latina in, in the Senate uh, from Nevada and uh, a first woman of Thai origin and Chinese heritage in the U.S. Senate from Illinois. So, and it's not just saying that, oh, this is such great, let's hold hands and celebrate this diversity. We're talking about how people's experiences, family, upbringing, uh, uh, real concerns and struggles inform their policy making. And to what extent can they then see their constituents in all of their complexity and with a wide range of experiences, how can they be responsive to those constituents? I know you are now a professor emerita at UNM. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're slowing down, but <laughs> how, how do you feel about your legacy? What are you most proud of? Well, there are, you know, several things. I'll just say quickly, I, I, I am very proud of um, my teaching and a whole lot of students that I hope I touch their lives in a positive and supportive way. I'm very proud of, of the students that I know are making a difference. I'll quickly claim a little bit of success with our sec current Secretary of State, who is a Just former one of your students. One of former student. Uh, I have students now, professors at the University of Arkansas, teaching in Latino politics, at Beloit College in Wisconsin, at the University of South Dakota, and she has just gotten herself elected, or will have herself probably elected to the city council in this oh, really? little town in South <laughs> Dakota. Uh, I know someone who is heading up the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. Uh, I know judges sitting on the bench. A former student is a federal judge down south. Uh, so those things make me very proud. But I'm also very proud of building a field 
that we started from nowhere, from scratch. Uh, we called it Chicano politics or Chicano studies. Uh, just recently, UNM passed uh, with a faculty and regents approval a um, graduate program in Chicano and Chicana studies. Um, I, I, in political science, we've, we've entered the ranks of leadership of the association. Uh, we've made institutional change at the Smithsonian Institution and their programming. We're making changes in lots of different fields. Megan, I, I, I wish that we also would find it easier to do those things, but still there is contested transformation. It's incremental change, it's wonderful change, change that I'm very proud of, but it is still a fight. Well, Christine Sierra, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Thank you again for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored.